So those are your, your cough suppressants. Uh, <coughs> controlling inflammation. Inflammation is a, a big part of a variety of diseases. Um, you obviously know that. Uh, particularly in um, feline asthma and equine COPD, uh, allergies play a significant role in inflammation. And it's not uncommon to add a systemic glucocorticoid, at least in the early parts of an acute exasperation, to calm things down. Now, this plays a role longer term, <coughs> and we would rather not have them on long-term steroids, all right? Now, admittedly, the cat tolerates it better than most other species, so you'll see that done sometimes. Uh, the horse is more problematic, uh, especially because they're more at risk from laminitis uh, associated with glucocorticoids, particularly dexamethasone, which is the main one we use. Again, steroids won't in and of themselves in a healthy horse cause laminitis, but if they have predisposing factors, it may trigger it. Well, we can avoid the systemic effects by using a locally acting steroid. And these are the respiratory inhalers. Uh, uh, Becanase or baclomethazone uh, has been out a long time. The one you're probably most familiar with is fluticasone, which is Flonase. It's available as a uh, nasal spray for allergies, but it's also available as an inhalant uh, in asthma and related inflammation. <coughs> and uh, uh, of course, we can't t teach our animals to uh, inhale while I puff this, uh, so we use a, a spacer. And this was originally used in pediatrics for the same reason. They couldn't tell the kids breathe deeply now if it's a one-year-old. So they have this spacer where you puff the uh, aerosol into this, and then the animal breathes back and forth to pull uh, the fog, the aerosol in. And here you see, um, a mask covering the nostril on the horse, and here's one uh, used for the cat. They have them also for dogs, I believe. All right. Uh, <coughs> the benefit of these is that they're very water insoluble, so they're not absorbed very much systemically. They have their local effect, but very little systemic absorption. Even when they're coughed up and swallowed, they're not really absorbed very well. So that's the benefit. We can have a local uh, steroid effect in the lung without the systemic side effects. Now this, this is one, this is grayed out because you don't have to, to know it. Uh, uh, there are leukotriene inhibitors. Remember in the arachidonic acid cascade, uh, uh, the leukotrienes are involved, lipoxygenase uh, takes it on. And uh, these singular and accolate are approved in human asthma and seasonal allergies. Uh, no one has ever been uh, um, able to prove a benefit in our animals. Uh, occasionally, I've seen posts of uh, using these in feline asthma. Kind of the, the empiric consensus is they don't help a whole lot. So yes, they're out there. If you find a dose and want to try it, I suppose they're relatively well tolerated, but not a lot of evidence that shows that they work. Decreasing pulmonary capillary pressure kind of goes along somewhat with pulmonary edema. In fact, you, uh, reasons to do this, uh, fluid overload, um, and we'll come later to the urinary drugs I'll talk about acute renal failures where it's really easy to accidentally volume overload a patient. The same thing with a heart failure. Uh, you can volume overload them if they're not already coming in uh, with a volume overload um, and um, uh, associated conditions. So what can we do to decrease the pulmonary capillary pressure? And, and why does this help in, in pulmonary edema? Well, remember uh, the Frank Starling laws in terms of uh, fluid movement. If edema is occurring, you've either got increased hydrostatic pressure, decreased oncotic pressure, or damaged endothelium allowing things to leak out. That's basically how edema occurs from a general mechanism wherever in the body. But if you can alter the hydrostatic pressure, decrease it by decreasing this pulmonary capillary pressure, you decrease one of the driving forces of fluid out uh, into the tissue. 
things that do this, morphine causes splanchnic vasodilation. I didn't mention this because we seldom use morphine for this. It's a, it's a common thing in human medicine, uh, but because of the emetic activity, uh, we don't see this use. The one that we do use a lot is furosemide. This decreases preload and vascular volume, blood volume by its diuretic action. But a big thing I want you to note is that uh, it also uh, has a local vasodilatory effect in the lung. It causes, a, I think it's a prostaglandin E release in the pulmonary vasculature, which vasodilates that, those pulmonary vessels. And when you're, you've got the same amount of blood and your blood vessel is this narrow versus this narrow, obviously the hydrostatic pressure is a lot lower on the, the, the vasodilated vessels than the normal. So uh, we see a pretty prominent uh, improvement in pulmonary edema, very commonly from furosemide that occurs before the diuretic activity has really had a significant impact. Okay, this is also probably, this isn't related directly to it, but uh, exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage in horses. Furosemide is the main tr treatment there. Uh, in the states where it's allowed, if you have a bleeder, uh, which is uh, the lay term for this, they'll give them furosemide prior to the race uh, to decrease this. And presumably this is how it does it, decreasing the hydrostatic pressure driving that out. And it varies state to state as to whether they allow that or not. I'll talk about the methylxanthines, uh, the Offlin being the main one that we use as bronchodilators. Uh, that's their main use, but we do uh, see a benefit there as well in pulmonary edema. Now pulmonary hypertension uh, is a little different. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat this again because I think it's important you understand the pathophysiology. In the rest of the body, when a tissue gets hypoxic, blood vessels vasodilate to improve blood flow in hopes of increasing oxygenation. The lung is 180 degrees. <clears throat> when a lobe of the lung is hypoxic from disease, it vasoconstricts in that lobe to shunt the blood to healthy lung tissue. Okay, so that's a compensatory mechanism uh, to improve oxygenation, and it works. The problem comes in when you have diffuse lung disease, where there is really no healthy lung tissue to shunt it to, and you wind up with pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension often is primarily associated with chronic lung disease, chronic bronchitis, fibrosis associated with it, uh, these sorts of things. Easily oxygen is our best vasodilator. Uh, oh, and by the way, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, altitude uh, sickness, um, high mountain disease, same reason. They get hypoxic up in the mountains, vasoconstrict, and then all sorts of things go wrong. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. They all vasoconstrict and then the pressure goes up. <coughs> so uh, in the acute scenario, oxygen is what you, you want uh, to give. Uh, a lot of the people that you see carrying around oxygen bottles, they're doing that as, uh, often for pulmonary hypertension instead of uh, other diseases. Now, <laughs> grayed out here so you don't have to know it, these are various things that are used in human medicine for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, in the emergency, they can use inhaled nitric oxide, uh, prostacycline, uh, CRIs, but none of this has really uh, been investigated and certainly most of it, like inhaled nitric oxide, is not really practical in our patients. The one thing that does work is sildenafil. You know it as Viagra. It's actually approved as the drug Revatio in humans for pulmonary hypertension. So it's not just the erectile dysfunction, it's actually approved for pulmonary hypertension. It inhibits phosphodiesterase 5 and what this does, it uh, inhibits the degradation of cyclic GMP 
So it accumulates and you get a um, potentiation of the nitric oxide vasodilation. And the good thing about it is it's relatively selective for the pulmonary artery. Uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of effects on blood pressure in, in the rest of the body. Now the exception, if you listen to the commercials, is uh, nitrates as vasodilators can cause a synergistic drop in blood pressure, but largely it's pretty well tolerated. The biggest problem here is the expense. It's a very expensive drug to use on an, on an ongoing basis, and this is going to be for the rest of the life of their an that animal that they're going to be on sildenafil. Um, hopefully a generic will come out um, at the end of this year or early next year and that will bring the price down, I hope.